Uh oh. Any Braves fans in the house? Three, three and a half games out. Watch out. Okay. I'm a big, I'm a big Cardinals fan. And I'm a big fan of Albert Pujols, right? Albert Pujols is one of the best baseball players of the last couple years, uh, undeniably. Even if you're not a fan of my team, I think he's undeniably one of the best players around. Albert Pujols is a monster on any given day of the week, right? He's a great player all the time. But there is one day of the year where I know that he's going to be especially on fire. Because you see, Albert Pujols has a daughter with Down syndrome, and a couple of times a year, he, his foundation brings his, his daughter and um, other, other folks impacted by Down syndrome out to the park, gives them great seats, treats them like royalty, and has a special awareness event and does all these great things for them. I know that when I see that featured, selfishly, as a baseball fan, I know that he's going to have a monster night. I know that he's going to be extra on that night. Because for Albert Pujols that night, it's not about a contract year. It's not about the standings. It's about putting on a show for his daughter and her friends. And it's bigger, it's bigger than a game for him at that point. He, he's talked about, that's his motto. It's bigger, uh, what he does is bigger than a game. Because uh, hitting a little ball with a bat, it's easy, to, it's easy to let that slide. But doing something fantastic for people that mean something to him, doing something that's meaningful and purposeful, his performance, he's at the peak of his game when that meaning is right there in front of him. And I would suggest to you all that the more that you can keep that mission and that meaning right in front of you, the more that you're going to be at the top of your own game. Okay. Raise your hand if you're married or have a serious relationship. Okay. Most of us. Okay. So you will have never heard of this, right? <laughs> right? That's right. How many times in a relationship or a marriage have you heard, you change this? No, well, I'll change this when you change this, right? Or people often do this with communication. Understand me, understand me. No, you understand me, right? And I'll understand you when you understand me. Well, that's funny because that's what I'm doing too, right? Let's talk for a minute about the second piece of deep leadership, which is accepting unflinching responsibility. When we do this, when we engage in this sort of stubborn, change-resistant behavior, right, we think we are powerful at this point, right? We think we're digging in our heels, we're stubborn, we're powerful, um, no, one, no one can tell me anything, right? But think about what you've done at this moment. You've given over your power, you've given over the decisional capabilities you have to that other person, and you've predicated all of your actions on their actions. And what could be more powerless than this? Raise your hand if you have kids now. Okay. How many of you have told your kids when they said, Mom, Billy made me angry, or you know, Billy made me cuss, or do this, or do that. You said, sweetie, no one can make you do anything, right? We say this to our kids, we understand this intuitively, but yet we don't live it sometimes in our, or in our organizations. In addition to Outliers, another book that I'd commend unto all of you who haven't read it yet is Viktor Frankl's book, which is Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was a, was a psychiatrist, an Austrian psychiatrist in World War II, a, a Jewish man whose family was incarcerated in the, the concentration camps, and his wife and his parents were killed as part of this. But Dr. Frankl, in the midst of what is undeniably one of the most brutal and inhumane moments in human history came up with ideas like this. And he says, everything can be taken from a man or woman, but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Okay? Real leaders, real leaders like Dr. Frankel know that leadership begins with me that making progress begins with me, and that waiting for other people to treat me kindly or to cater to my whims or to do what I want them to do is only a recipe for disaster and for a recipe for gridlock like we saw before. And frankly, if this man can make it work, 
under this most vile of human circumstances, we can all make it work in our organizations, whatever their shortcomings may be. Okay? Part of responsibility, too, is knowing ourselves. Okay? Again, I talked earlier about measuring these sort of personality characteristics in people. And we see that a number of personality characteristics are what we call normally distributed. So it breaks out, you know, sort of like this. There's a couple of people on either tail and there's a lot of people in the middle. But most people have a preference to one side or another. Okay? Change is that way. And as I talked to the colonel, I was, I was struck by how much change you have all been asked to make. And he was very, very complimentary of the job that you've all done in making those changes. I think I remember the words he said where some, some of you saw as great Americans because you had, had given up so much for this mission, for this purpose that we talked about. I want you to think about where you are as you are a part of an organization that's always changing on this change curve. Are you way over here where you love change? This, this is where I'm at, right? My wife will laugh because I'll blow something up just to make it work again, right? Like, I, I'll fix it and fix it even if it ain't broke, okay? Or are you way over here on this other end of the curve where, you, where you're a very traditional person? You want things to stay the way they've been and you get upset when, when, when people upset the apple cart. I come from a family that's pretty change, pretty change oriented and not very traditional at all, and my wife is very much the other way. Um, and last, last Thanksgiving, I had an idea that I wanted to make uh, uh, burgers and french fries for Thanksgiving, and I nearly lost my wife to a heart attack, right? So <laughs> this, was no, this was not going to happen for her. So find yourself on here, because what happens is, when changes come, a lot of times we don't take that responsibility, but we blame other people because we don't realize where we sit along this continuum, right? We don't realize, well, you know what? To be fair, maybe I am a little stubborn. Maybe I am a little resistant. Or on the other end, maybe we don't realize, hey, maybe I should stop blowing stuff up and reinventing the wheel because it's frustrating some of these other folks. You're getting all kinds of reading suggestions today. A, a man named Daniel Pink recently came out with a fantastic book that talks about our motivation to change. And he says, uh, aside from money, right, we could, all, we could all probably get thrown enough money to do all, all, all manner of changing, right? But after money's taken care of, there are three things that determine whether or not we're going to make a change. And they are map. That's the way I remember them. Mastery, autonomy, and purpose. Okay? So in this room, there are people that are driving change. And there are people that are called upon to enact change. And I want nobody to get off the hook today, right? So I want to speak to both of you. If you are driving change, you need to keep these three things in mind. Because every time you introduce a change, the people you lead are less masterful at this new thing that you've introduced, right? Because it's new, and they don't know how to do it yet. They'll get there, but they're less masterful at it, and that's going to mess with their motivation. Secondly, they probably have less autonomy because you've probably got to look over their shoulder a little bit more, and nobody likes that, right? The third thing is people really want to know why they're making a change. They want to know the purpose. And so sometimes in a, um, in a hierarchy, that can, get, that can get lost, and it can turn into because I said so. And sometimes that is an important thing when, it's the, when time is of the essence and there's really no time to explain or hold hands. Sometimes because I said so is all you get. But after that, I think it's best to debrief and help people understand what is the purpose of all this? Where is this going? And how does this tie back into that broader mission that we've talked about? If you're called on to drive change, if you're one of these people who's always getting things changed up on them, right? Do all that you can to quickly get yourself up to speed and to a level of mastery. Because a lot of times what happens is you don't realize why you're so frustrated. You might project that onto your boss or get upset with the process when really all it is is that you want to be competent and you want to be skilled at what you're doing, which is a natural and a positive thing, right? Work with that supervisor to try and uh, tease out the autonomy piece and figure it all out, right? 
Uh, figure out what's an ideal amount of oversight. How can you get supported without getting stifled? And push to understand the purpose. And if you get that not right now answer, push again a little bit later to try and understand how this fits back into that mission that means so much to you. <clears throat> okay. I want to talk a little bit now about responsibility and communication. So major news publications have called this generation lazy, lacking focus, not as hardworking as their parents, and morally loose. Right? Which generation is it? Uh oh. Look, look at this guy. It's, it's all of them, right? These criticisms have been levied against baby boomers, Generation X, and now Generation Y, right? One of the things that we run into is that humans, a, a truth about humans is that we're cognitively lazy, right? We want to put people in boxes because we want to have some, we want to have some shorthand ways to make decisions about folks. And so you see me in the hall and you go, that guy's Generation Y, he's probably a, he, he's probably a lazy so-and-so, right? Um, when we do this, we really, really shortcut communication because we're communicating with an idea or a stereotype and, and not a human being. <clears throat> when we allow stereotypes of people, and there are all types of people. I, I commented to Ashley earlier, this is such an interesting crowd. You have, you have men and women in uniform. You have people dressed very formally. You have people dressed very informally. You represent all different pieces of this organization and come from all different backgrounds. And I know, we won't ask anybody to say, but I know that you have stereotypes about the different people that are represented in, within this organization. But when you rely on those stereotypes and those broad sweeping generalities without getting to know the person and tailor that communication to them, you've lost. You're following again. You're following a stereotype and not leading by finding out who that person is and how you can best communicate with them. I'm about out of time today, but I want to close with this. I know that you all are very, very lucky to work for an organization that has such an overwhelmingly powerful purpose, right? There are many, many jobs that you could do that you could not feel as good about at the end of the day as you do this job. This job is, I'm sure, fraught with its own shortcomings and annoyances, but I hope that you can do whatever it takes to keep that big picture and that very critical mission in front of you. Um, the second thing that I want to leave with you is that change and flexibility are signs of leadership, not signs of weakness. Being malleable, being able to go with the flow, really means that you're empowered, whereas being stubborn means that you've given up that control and that freedom to someone else. And I want to leave you all, I want to leave you all with a challenge. Because 30 minutes of me yakking at you doesn't really do much at the end of the day unless you take some of these things home and try and implement them in your own life. Okay? So I want you to think to yourself right now, what's one behavior that I engage in that is really more about me? It's more about me and my own selfish desire to look good or not work as hard as I should, or whatever it is, what's one behavior that I engage in that's more about me and less about the mission? And how could I replace that with something that's a little bit more mission-driven and in service of this most worthwhile cause in which you're all laboring? Um, guys, I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, and I hope that you've uh, heard something today that you can take with you and make you a better employee of RTC. Thank you. <clears throat> I, that, Dr. Crosby, that is certainly right on target with our organization. You understand the, the leadership piece. It was very inspirational and, and just superb. And thank, thank you very, very thank much, you so much for coming thank and talking so to us. Appreciate thank it. You.